10 themes to know for the unit tests on the People's Republic of China, Unit 6 of AP Comparative Government. First up, geography, the constitution, and the reign of Chairman Mao. For geography, you need to understand that China is the fourth largest country in the world after Russia, Canada, and the U.S. It contains 22 provinces and five autonomous regions. The Chinese nationalists were pushed off to the island of Taiwan when they were defeated by Mao's guerrilla soldiers. Taiwan has remained a separate governing body from the PRC to this day. Hong Kong is also a very important city economically for China, but it has flirted with the idea of becoming its own sovereign city in recent decades. The Constitution of China actually has two constitutions, one that organizes the Communist Party and another that actually organizes the state itself. China is designed to be a very unitary state in its constitutional structure, meaning it's very centralized, and its current constitution was ratified in the year 1982. Under the reign of their most historical and prominent leader, Chairman Mao Zedong, who came to power in 1949, Mao instituted communism through his own beliefs, particularly initially taking it from the Soviet model. He collectivized agriculture, set national production goals, and restricted private ownership of land. His Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution are two of the most significant and historical examples of attempts in which Mao tried to reform the country in his own communist vision. Still widely respected and revered to this day, Chairman Mao's reign did have several major accomplishments, but also several major failures. Under his leadership, he was given credit for driving out the Chinese nationalists and the Japanese, which is a great sense of deep nationalism that runs through the Chinese people to this day. He also created the Iron Rice Bowl, which guaranteed full employment for all Chinese citizens and a wide range of social benefits. And he oversaw the country's complete overturn from a very rural country to a much more urbanized country, through rapid industrialization. But of course, Mao created a system in which there was low motivation to produce, and thus, with being cut off from international trade, the economy did not grow and became stagnant. They also mismanaged most of their resources, including food and agricultural products, leading to widespread famine, particularly during his Great Leap Forward. And there was wide acceptance of harsh authoritarian rule in his reign that has perpetuated into society even today. Deng Xiaoping, Mao's successor, set to work immediately on reforming the Chinese economy. He opened it up to international influences in trade, began privatizing many of the state-owned enterprises, and instituted the household responsibility system, which granted farmers more choice over the products that they produced and how much they wanted to produce. Making it more competitive actually increased efficiency and motivation for farmers. Today, the Chinese economy considers itself a socialist market economy, meaning it takes many elements of capitalism, but also is still under the control of the Communist Party. China is the second largest trading country in the world today after only the United States, as much of its economy is based today on commerce. Its largest imports include industrial machinery and technology. China does have many large oil reserves that it uses domestically, but also still imports petroleum due to large energy demands. Today there are more privately owned enterprises than there are state owned enterprises, and the state owned enterprises are forced to compete thus the elements of capitalism in the socialist market economy. China has and continues to be the largest growing economy in the world, but when you take into account its massive population, it has a relatively low GDP and GNP and makes it still a developing country by most political scientists. The key to the economic transformation in China has really been a shift from more ideological leaders like Mao to more technocratic leaders who have college education and experience in the business field and with the economics. Number three is the role of ethnicity, civil society, and cleavages in Chinese society. In terms of ethnicity and religion, China is not exactly the most diverse of all the countries that we'll study this year, as over 90% of its population is considered Han Chinese. However, there are still millions of ethnic and religious minorities, but they are mostly contained to the western part of the country, with the biggest bulk coming in Tibet. China is officially an atheist country, but has large influences of Buddhism and Taoism in various portions. The clergy are heavily controlled and imprisoned if they criticize the Communist Party in any way. The Constitution of China does call for religious freedom, but in reality, religious freedom is heavily monitored by the state and controlled, much like civil society, which is also very limited. There are pro-democracy groups that have sprung up in various packs around the country, but for the most part they are marginalized by the government. The Tiananmen Square Massacre in 1989 sent a clear message from the state to the members of society that these types of rallies would not be tolerated. In terms of their cleavages, there have been great income gaps and educational gaps that have been divided between urban and rural residents as a result of economic growth. 
With a more liberalized market economy, some have found it easier to achieve great wealth, particularly urban residents and entrepreneurs, while people in rural areas and farmers have been left behind to fend for themselves. Full employment is no longer guaranteed as it was during the Mao era, and because of this, rural residents and farmers are the most likely group to try to stand up to the CCP. The biggest institution for power is, of course, the Chinese Communist Party within China. China is considered a one-party system or communist party system because every aspect of its state is under the control of the Communist Party. The Constitution formally forbids the formation of any other parties. There are small pockets of pro-democracy groups in different parts around the country, but the CCP is never in fear that they will compete with them, and never in fear that they'll lose seats to them in the legislature. The CCP claims to be what we call a vanguard party because they claim they have the country's best interest at heart, and thus there's no need for anyone else to challenge them. The party maintains presence throughout every province in China to ensure uniformity under the unitary state. Throughout the country, provincial party leaders select the members who will move forward to the National Party Congress. The National Party Congress helps shape the party's policies and where it wants to go in the future. But only a very select group of them, about 25 of the elites, will become part of the very top Politburo. And of that Politburo, only nine of them will be a part of the Permanent Standing Committee, the leader of which being the General Secretary. Only approximately 10 to 15 percent of China's population is actually granted membership into the CCP because once you're in, you have a great opportunity for upward mobility in the political arena and in the business world. The CCP institutes several methods of political socialization to keep control of the people, one of which is control of the education sector, with a rigorous system that is restricted to most kids after the elementary level. There is an element of political study that is still mandated, though it is not as high in the curriculum as it once was under Mao. All Chinese youth are also expected to participate in the Young Pioneers program, which teaches them about party loyalty. In terms of religion, of course, the CCP heavily monitors all demonstrations that are religious-based and, of course, controls the clergy. The CCP also loves to tap into the proud history of the Chinese people and their proud ancestry by using propaganda that rallies people under the party's control. The CCP also heavily monitors the media, particularly the Internet, to make sure that Western influence is not trickling into Chinese society. They do much of the same by having strict publishing guidelines when it comes to Chinese literature. It is no secret to anybody that China is the most populated country in the world with a population that is just shy of 1.4 billion. Nearly 20% of the world's population is located within China. China has today what we call a floating population. as It's been a gradual movement from the rural areas to the more urban areas in order to find work. To help control this massive population, several decades ago, the government instituted the one-child policy. It has been effective at slowing down population growth compared to several other nations, and it has made it easier for families to feed their children with less calls for famine. However, it has also led to a great gender imbalance, which has led to many unmarried males and a dangerous environment in some parts of the country for females who could be kidnapped and sold off as brides. The policy, however, has been much more loosely enforced in the rural areas, where families need the help on the farms, as well as in areas of ethnic and religious minority domination. Since the establishment of the current Chinese constitution, which was ratified in 1982, the President of the People's Republic of China actually holds a dual title, as he is also the General Secretary of the Communist Party of China. The Chinese President serves a five-year term and is limited to two consecutive terms. He is informally selected by the legislature, but really gains access to his office by the virtue of the fact that he was chosen by his party to be the General Secretary. Some of his powers include in crafting policy, signing treaties, serving as the Commander-in-Chief of the People's Liberation Army, and crafting a budget as well as using his power of decree. The Vice President position is a guaranteed ticket to the presidency, as several modern leaders like Hu Jintao and the current President, Xi Jinping, were Vice Presidents prior to becoming the presidency. It has created a very predictable transition method, as we always know in advance who the next leader will be. The Premier works underneath of the President and oversees the activities of the Cabinet, also known as the State Council. The bureaucracy in China is very large and is used to enforce policies in a way that the CCP sees fit. All members of the bureaucracy and all government workers at all levels are referred to as cadres. Cadres are also bound to a two-term limit, and there have been efforts in recent decades to try to professionalize them more and make them more technocratic. However, the system of nomenclature, which was deep ingrained in the Soviet system and carried over into the Mao era, is still in place in many areas in which party loyalty is helping several members earn jobs as cadres. 
The lawmaking body of China, or the legislature, known as the National People's Congress, not to be confused with the National Party Congress, organized within the CCP, is the first unicameral legislature that we've discussed this year, thus meaning it only has one chamber. It consists of over 2,000 legislators who are elected from the provincial congresses, but these legislators are not year-round legislators. Only a small fragment of them will join the standing committee, which will actually hold year-round policy-making functions. They are still widely considered to be a rubber stamp legislature that simply votes the way that the executive tells them to vote. Votes are never in question on almost any policy that is initiated within the state. Elections are extremely non-competitive and almost all of them are indirect except for the elections that occur in villages and small towns. Villages and small towns are given this discretion only because they want to try to avoid some of the corruption that is much more easily to occur at the local level. There is also a major lack of political transparency in China. The candidates are secretly picked by the CCP. The media portrays these candidates only as the CCP wants or endorses. All proceedings and meetings of the NPC are private, with no cameras allowed. And there is no discussion ever in Chinese media of the budget or the amount of money that government workers make. Number nine is about the Chinese legal system and Chinese military. The legal system in China is code-based, and there is an over 90% conviction rate, as cases are never in doubt from the beginning to end. All judiciary appointments have to be approved by the CCP, and China uses capital punishment more than any country in the world. The Supreme People's Court, the highest federal court of China, is restricted from having the power of judicial review, and thus cannot get in the way of any decisions made by the executive or the NPC. The Chinese military is particularly looked at through the lens of the People's Liberation Army. It is considered a major source of strength for the country and regarded as one of the world's best trained militaries. It has universal conscription of both men and women, however it has never needed to use the draft because of its massive population and the prestige and honor that comes with serving in the PLA. There is a two-year mandated service requirement for all Chinese when they turn 18. Finally, the contemporary challenges that China faces moving forward in the 21st century, and probably their biggest question is how long can the CCP continue to shield its people from the democratic wave that has been undertaken throughout the world, as they are now one of very few communist states left in the world, as most move from authoritarianism to democracy in some form. With lack of competition and lack of transparency, that will be the ultimate question. There is also immense poverty, particularly in the vast rural areas of the country, that will have to be dealt with. Their relationship with regions like Tibet, Taiwan, and Hong Kong will also spell what the future of China will be like. The PRC has stated that it would love to reunify with each of these regions. Also, increased health concerns have come about with epidemics such as SARS and the HIV-AIDS virus. Another major question moving forward for the Chinese government will be how do they deal with the environmental degradation that's been caused from the liberalization of their economy. Very poor air and poor water quality along with the loss of natural habitat has occurred for several reasons. The deregulation of many of the industries, the increased presence of automobiles, and the increased amount of consumption that comes with a more market-driven economy. In the CCP, there has been great division, and two factions have formed because of this. The elitists, who say, grow the economy at any cost necessary, and the populists, who want to pay attention to the effects of the growth on the environment. The populists have attempted in recent years to try to reform some of this to address the environmental issues, although not with great success. They have attempted temporary shutdowns of some of the worst factory offenders, and they've attempted to put some limits on vehicle emissions. But, of course, China still has a long way to go in this arena. For the free response portion of the exam, one question will dip into the Chinese economy and the effect on the environment. Another will look at the issue of political transparency and how it applies to China. And finally, you'll want to be familiar with some of the characteristics that make a country either a part of the developed world or a part of the developing world.